Hello YouTube. In this video I want to fairly briefly present a view known as logical nihilism. It hasn't received much discussion in the literature. My presentation is based on some papers by Gillian Russell, in particular the paper Logical Nihilism. Could there be no logic? So, according to logical nihilism, there are no laws of logic. To put this in more formal terms, we would say that the relation of logical consequence is empty. All claims of the form gamma entails phi, where gamma is some set of premises and phi a conclusion, are false. There is no pairing of premises and conclusion such that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises, such that the premises logically entail the conclusion. So just to be more clear about what the scope of this claim is, what, what exactly do we mean by a logical law? Well, laws of logic are going to include the uh, logical truths or logically valid formulas such as um, the law of non-contradiction or the law of the excluded middle. Uh, those are often proposed as logical laws. Um, so in this case, gamma entails phi. You can think of gamma as being the empty set. Um, also, logically valid arguments, modus ponens, disjunctive syllogism, uh, double negation elimination, conjunction elimination, etc. Um, the logical nihilist holds that all of these claims are false. I mean, these are just some examples from classical propositional logic. Obviously, there are more sophisticated kinds of logic, but the logical nihilist will, will hold that, that all such claims are, are false. Uh, any claim, essentially, involving the, uh, the, the entailment symbol. Now, this may appear to be a radical position, but there's a fairly straightforward argument for it. Uh, Russell puts the argument like this. To be a law of logic, a principle must hold in complete generality. No principles hold in complete generality, therefore there are no laws of logic. The logical nihilist will hold that all laws of logic are false because there are counterexamples to all of them. So there are some cases, for example, where the law of non-contradiction um, fails to hold, where there are, true, there are some true contradictions. There are some co cases where modus ponens fails to preserve truth, where an argument with the form of modus ponens has true premises but a false conclusion. Okay, so let's go through this uh, logical nihilist argument. Premise one that laws of logic must hold in complete generality. Now, this was almost universally accepted until fairly recently. It's not a particularly controversial assumption. One point to bear in mind here, however, is obviously everybody accepts that there are different logical systems and uh, different laws will hold in each. In classical logic, for example, uh, ex falso quod libet, or the principle of explosion, is valid. Uh, this tells us that from a contradiction, everything follows. Uh, paraconsistent logics reject explosion. Similarly, disjunctive syllogism is valid in classical logic, but not in paraconsistent logics. Uh, the law of excluded middle is a logical truth of classical logic, but is rejected by intuitionistic logics. So, looking at this proliferation of different logical systems, you might be tempted to say, well, pretty clearly, premise one is false. Um, logical principles don't have to hold in complete generality. Uh, obviously, this would be a misunderstanding. Um, so we can develop logical systems for all sorts of different purposes. But one of the reasons to develop a logical system is to offer an account of correct reasoning. Uh, a logical system can be presented as a theory of correct reasoning, as a, a theory which tells us when the premises of an argument entail the conclusion. So I've noted that in classical logic, um, just to give you an example here, so in classical logic, disjunctive syllogism is valid. P or Q, not Q, therefore P. <clears throat> so in classical logic, those those premises entail that conclusion. Now, nobody doubts that this is valid within classical logic, but some people defend dialetheism, the view that there are true contradictions. A dialetheist will say that there are instances of disjunctive syllogism where the premises are true and the conclusion false. And so classical logic does not provide a correct theory of valid inference. Um, in particular, the dialetheist will say that disjunctive syllogism fails to hold for contradictory propositions. So here's an example of what might be a contradictory proposition. Heterological is heterological. Okay, we say that an adjective is heterological when it does not describe itself. For example, the adjective long 
is heterological because it does not describe itself. Long is not a long word, it's a short word. Similarly, hyphenated is heterological because hyphenated is not hyphenated. Okay, question. Is heterological a heterological word? Well, if you, if you think it through, you will find that whatever answer you give will lead to a contradiction. Um, whether, whether you say it is heterological or whether you say it's not heterological, um, you're going to get a contradiction. So the sentence heterological is heterological is often proposed as a sentence that is both true and false. Now there is of course an enormous debate about whether there actually are any true contradictions. Most philosophers will try to deal with apparently contradictory sentences in different ways. They will try to explain away the appearance of contradiction, but there are a few who just embrace the appearance. Um, they are called dialetheists. And let's suppose they are right about this. Suppose that heterological is heterological is a true contradiction. Well then, we can have this argument. Uh, Santa Claus exists or heterological is heterological. It is not the case that heterological is heterological, so Santa Claus exists. If our proposition is in fact a true contradiction, if it is, tr if it is both true and false that heterological is heterological, then we have here an instance of disjunctive syllogism with true premises and a false conclusion. <clears throat> so disjunctive syllogism can be proved within classical logic, but a dialetheist will say that classical logic does not provide the right account of valid inference, because in fact there are situations where it does not preserve truth, where we can't infer the conclusion on the basis of the premises. Um, and so, so with, with this point in mind then, we can think of logical nihilism as the view that no logical system or a collection of logical systems gives us an account of correct inference. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the point when we, when we talk about logical laws holding in complete generality. Everybody acknowledges that there are different logical systems, um, but we're thinking of these logical systems as attempts to provide a theory of correct inference. Okay. Um, now, even with all that said, there is uh, actually some debate about uh, the premise that logical laws hold incomplete generality. Uh, this premise is denied by logical pluralists who think that different logics are correct for different kinds of cases. Um, the standard response to logical pluralism is just that, by definition, a law of logic has to hold for absolutely all cases. We won't discuss logical pluralism further here, but uh, it's worth noting that there are philosophers who have rejected uh, Russell's first premise. Okay, having made this clarification, it's worth specifying a bit more precisely what the general truth of logical principles would require. Now, as Russell notes, there are, uh, in fact, a number of different ways of defining the logical consequence relation. And these different definitions give rise to different ways of understanding what logical nihilism amounts to. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail here, and I'm simplifying Russell's presentation a little bit, but it's worth giving a, a, a brief overview of, of some of these uh, different interpretations of logical consequence. First of all, there is the world's account. On the world's account, gamma entails phi is true if and only if, in every possible world in which all the members of gamma are true, phi is true also. Maybe a more colloquial way to put this would be to talk instead about different states the world could be in. If every worldly state makes all the members of gamma true, if every worldly state that makes all the members of gamma true makes phi true as well, then phi is a logical consequence of gamma. One major problem with this account is that there appear to be uh, necessary truths, propositions that are true in all possible worlds, which we wouldn't want to think of as logical truths. So. Um, you know, the morning star is the evening star, and water is H2O, for example, um, don't seem to hold as a matter of logical necessity. Um, but anyway, if we accept this account, then logical nihilism is the view that um, for any gamma and phi, there is a world in which every member of gamma is true, but phi is not. Uh, second, there is the substitutional account. On this account, gamma entails phi is true if and only if, when we keep the logical expressions in gamma and phi fixed, we can substitute uh, any of the non-logical expressions in gamma and phi for other non-logical expressions without making all members of gamma true and phi false. Um, so, you know, you just switch out the non-logical words for other non-logical words. 
Um, one problem with this account is that it makes logical consequence dependent on the richness of one's language. The English language, for example, does not contain expressions denoting every single object in the universe. Um, we don't have like a name for every atom, say. Um, but uh, anyway, if we accept this account, then logical nihilism will amount to the view that um, there's always some way to substitute non-logical expressions in gamma and phi, such as to make every member of gamma true while phi is false. Finally, there is the interpretational account. On this account, gamma entails phi is true if and only if no matter how we vary the interpretation of the non-logical expressions in gamma and phi, we cannot make the members of gamma true and phi false. So consider this very simple argument. Now, on the interpretations approach, if there's some object that's currently unnamed in our language, then we can just reinterpret the name A to refer to that object, right? Um, so <clears throat> on, on this approach, this argument becomes valid if and only if there's no interpretation of those non of the non-logical expressions that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. But so you know we're not switching out the words; we're just changing the interpretation of them. Okay, on this account, logical nihilism is the view that for any set of premises, uh, uh, for, for every you know uh, set of premises gamma and conclusion phi, there are interpretations of the non-logical expressions in gamma and phi that make all members of gamma true but phi false. So those are three different ways of thinking about what logical consequence amounts to, and so three different ways of being a logical nihilist. Um, there are other interpretations of logical consequence. Um, anyway, Russell assumes the interpretational account. So for, so for Russell, nihilism is the view that there's always an interpretation of the non-logical expressions such that the premises are true and the conclusion false. But the arguments for nihilism can be made on, uh, on the other accounts of consequence as well. Um, certainly what's important to see here is that on any of these accounts of logical consequence, logical laws make extremely strong claims because the claims are extremely general. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes said that you know, logic is supposed to be domain neutral, right? It's not about any particular thing. Uh, and you can kind of see that in these different interpretations of logical consequence. Um, logical laws are supposed to hold in all circumstances. And these are just different ways of thinking about what all circumstances actually, uh, it, it, how, that, how that phrase is to be precisely defined. Um, so this is what we mean when we say that logical laws are holding complete generality. Okay then, let's turn to the second premise of Russell's argument. This is a claim that there are no principles that hold incomplete generality. Now I said that Russell is assuming the interpretational account, so we can think of this premise as, so we can, we can read this as the claim that for any argument there is some interpretation uh, of the non-logical expressions in it that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. And this interpretation will then be a counterexample to the proposed, um, to the argument, to the proposed logical law. Now, an obvious point to note here is that the interpretation's account of logical consequence will only be workable if we have a sufficiently rich library of interpretations. So to take a simple example, suppose that the only interpretation available for atomic sentences is the value true. Well, in that case, there will be no interpretations of any argument that make the premises true and the conclusion false, and so there uh, will be no counterexample to any proposed law at all. Even, um, you know, obviously invalid arguments will, will turn out to be valid um, if this is our library of interpretations. So here we have the affirmation of the consequent. If P then Q, Q therefore P. This is a fallacy, but, um, you know, if our only interpretation available is the value true, then this is this is you know, we don't have a situation where there are true premises and a false conclusion. Um, so at the very least, we need to expand our library of interpretations to include the value false. Now, if we do that, we can uh, consider the interpretation such that p is false and q is true, and that will generate a counterexample to our uh, entailment claim there. Um, where we we so you have true premises, false conclusion. Now, assuming that the available interpretations are true and false, it will turn out that the law of excluded middle is a logical law. 
as shown in this truth table. But as Russell notes, perhaps our library of interpretations is impoverished. After all, perhaps some sentences can be neither true nor false. There are many reasons for thinking that there are sentences that are truth value gaps. They're neither true nor false. Um, arguments for this have been made on the basis of uh, empty terms, vagueness, future contingents, and so on. So there are lots of reasons philosophers have, have had for thinking that maybe some sentences are neither true nor false. So we add the value neither to our set of interpretations, and this gives us a counterexample to the law of excluded middle, at least assuming um, the interpretation of the connectives of strong clean logic, but um, that's kind of beside the point. The point is, you know, expanding the set of interpretations, we can get a counterexample to the law of excluded middle. We can continue to enrich our library of interpretations. Uh, we've already seen that there are philosophers who think that there are true contradictions. A true contradiction will be both true and false. So let's add the value both to our library of, of interpretations. Well, then we get counterexamples to modus ponens and disjunctive syllogism, as shown in these truth tables. And I should note that here I'm assuming the interpretation of the connectives in Priest's logic of paradox. Um, but anyway, just take the interpretation where P is both and Q is false. And um, in both cases, you know, you'll get your counterexample to modus ponens and disjunctive syllogism. Recall um, the derivation of the existence of Santa Claus from the contradiction heterological is heterological. Now, so far, this is well-trodden ground. Um, even if, if even if we add neither and both to our library of interpretations, we still have a fairly robust logical system. Um, we we can actually recover um, modus ponens by adopting a different definition of the conditional, and that's the option that is taken by most dialetheists like Graham Priest, because generally they don't want to give up modus ponens. Um, but the, you know, the, the point is, look, there are logical systems that incorporate neither and both into their library of interpretations, and you can still do quite a lot with those systems. What Russell is going to try to do now is, is to show that there can be counterexamples to every um, purported logical law. Before we look at her proposed counterexamples, though, it's worth noting that even at this point, we might have enough to at least take logical nihilism seriously, because there are plausible arguments against two principles that were once thought, indeed still are thought by some people, to be absolutely inviolable, the law of excluded middle and law of non-contradiction. You know, there, there, are there are plausible arguments that there are both uh, truth value gaps and true contradictions. Now, if these arguments are right, then we are forced to expand our library of interpretations, and this pushes us towards uh, weaker logics. Things that we once talked took to be logical laws turn out to have counterexamples. So what then could justify the confidence that a given logical law has no counterexamples? Perhaps we just haven't thought of the right examples. Perhaps we just haven't enriched our library of interpretations enough. Natural language is, after all, incredibly rich and messy. It contains vague predicates. It contains the truth predicate and other metalinguistic predicates. It has self-referential sentences, context sent sensitive sentences, sentences referring to mathematical objects like infinite sets and so on. Any of these might threaten a purported logical law. So even if you don't accept Russell's counterexamples, we might actually already have enough here to at least wonder if other genuine counterexamples might exist. Um, so anyway, what are Russell's counterexamples? Well, rather than examining each logical law one by one, Russell takes two uh, purported logical laws that seem to be the most secure, uh, conjunction, introduction, and identity. So in the case of conjunction, introduction, if you have two atomic sentences, P and Q, this entails the conjunction P and Q. Um, in identity, P entails P. Russell argues that there are interpretations that can provide counterexamples to both of these. Now, if this is right, if even conjunction introduction and identity fail as logical laws, then it does start to look like there might be no logical laws at all. Um, indeed, actually, it's not too difficult to see how to, how to extend Russell's argument to other purported logical laws. Uh, so what is Russell's argument? Well, Russell begins by noting that in logical analysis, one of the problematic features of language is 
context sensitivity, where context sensitive expressions are those that change their meaning with the context. Take the word here. Well, obviously here refers to a different place depending on who uses the term. So if we take the argument, if it is raining here, then it is wet here. It is raining here, therefore it is wet here. If it's raining where I am and sunny where you are and I assert the premises while you assert the conclusion, then we get true premises and a false conclusion. Apparently a counterexample to modus ponens. But of course, well, isn't this a bit silly? Um, I mean, it's not technically an equivocation because the meaning of the term here doesn't change, but um, because it's being used by different people, the reference changes. And so that's where the problem comes from. So, um, you know, so yeah, that's, that's obviously the source of the issue there. Now, Russell says there, there are three ways that logicians tend to deal with context sensitivity. First option is they can just ignore it. They can deal with idealized languages that do not contain context sensitive expressions. Second, they can treat uh, context sensitive expressions as logical constants so that these expressions are no longer within the scope of the interpretation function. That is, we no longer change interpretations of the context sensitive expressions. Um, both of those options are sort of formal maneuvers, not really applicable to everyday arguments, especially given how widespread context sensitive expressions are in natural languages. Um, so the final option uh, is simply to stipulate that context cannot change over the course of an argument. Um, that's sort of the, the standard move, I guess. The, you know, the, the reason why the argument given above isn't legitimate, isn't a legitimate instance of modus ponens, is because the relevant context changes from the premises to the conclusion, um, and that's just something we rule out. Now, the problem with this as a general solution is that there seem to be context-sensitive expressions that are sensitive to the sentential context. So consider the predicate con white. When con white appears in an atomic sentence, it has the same extension as white. So snow is con white is true. It tells us the same thing as snow is white. However, when the sentence containing con white is embedded within a larger construction, the extension of con white becomes the null set. It just no longer refers. You know, it has the same extension as phlogiston or some other non-referring term. So snow is con white and grass is green is false because the first conjunct is false because in that first conjunct, con white no longer refers. It'd be like saying snow is phlogiston and grass is green. Now, here we have an apparent counterexample to conjunction introduction. Snow is con white and grass is green taken as atomic sentences entails snow is con white and grass is green. But that's not true. Um, well, that, that entailment claim is false. We have true premises, but a false conclusion. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> let's turn to identity. Uh, we can similarly construct predicates such that the truth value of the sentences in which these predicates appear varies depending on whether those sentences are stated as premises or conclusions. Consider the, the, the predicate prem white. The extension of prem white is the same as the extension of white when it appears in the premises of an argument, but is the null set when it appears in the conclusion. So we have a counterexample to identity. Um, snow is prem white entails snow is prem white. That's false. We have a true premise and a false conclusion. So the entailment claim is false. Now, it's fairly clear how this method could generate counterexamples to many other purported logical laws. So this supports um, premise two, um, and there is our fairly straightforward argument for logical nihilism. Once we allow predicates that are sensitive to linguistic context, we can get counterexamples to every logical law. What are the objections to this then? Well, an obvious response is to argue that the apparent counterexamples that we have provided are not genuine interpretations. Recall the definition of logical consequence that we're, we're using here. So, uh, gamma entails phi is true if and only if whatever interpretation is given to the non-logical expressions in gamma and phi, if every member of gamma is true, then so is phi. Well, we only have a counterexample to some purported logical law if the interpretation itself is acceptable. 
but this can always be resisted. This is just what happened in the debates concerning the law of excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction. Some philosophers propose that there are true contradictions. Now, if you accept this, if you accept there are true contradictions, then you're going to need to add the value both to your library of truth values, which will generate the counterexamples to disjunctive syllogism and other apparent logical laws. But most philosophers don't accept this. Then most philosophers will reject the claim that there are true contradictions. Um, Russell calls this the monster barring response. We say that the interpretation that provides the counterexample is not a legitimate interpretation for you know, one reason or another. Now this in itself is an interesting point. Um, so to resist logical nihilism, it looks like we need to draw a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate interpretations. And it must turn out that there are some arguments where on any legitimate interpretation, if all the premises are true, then so is the conclusion. The obvious danger of the monster barring response is that it is, or at least it might look suspiciously ad hoc. We end up disallowing interpretations simply because they provide counterexamples to the purported laws. We need to have reasons for thinking that an interpretation is illegitimate beyond the fact that it provides a counterexample to an apparent logical law. Now, in the case of true contradictions, well, there, there's a huge literature here. There are lots of arguments for and against the view that there can be true contradictions. Um, you know, many of the, like, if, if the objectors are success, if the, if the arguments against true contradictions are successful, then we've got a good reason to think, well, maybe that's not uh, a legitimate interpretation. Um, so are there reasons for thinking that the predicates con white and prem white are illegitimate? Well, the first thing to note here in defense of these predicates is that con white certainly isn't meaningless, right? It's perfectly understandable. It's perfectly well defined. It's, it's a very well defined predicate. It's possible to use this predicate in your thinking and your speech. Of course, it is a rather unusual predicate. But there are plenty of unusual predicates. Just take the predicate GRU from Goodman's New Riddle of Induction, which if you're not familiar with, you should go and check out my video on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an unusual predicate, but why, like, why would that mean that it's not legitimate? Um, another point here is that sensitivity to sentential context is not actually a new idea. Um, you know, it's, it's not a particularly in itself a particularly unusual idea. Uh, Frege thought that the extension of an expression could vary depending on whether or not that expression was embedded in the description of a propositional attitude. So if you take the expression, Captain Beefheart wrote Trout Mask Replica, well, you, can, you could embed that um, in a belief report. So Frank believes that Captain Beefheart wrote Trout Mask Replica. And what Frege would say is that when the sentence is just asserted on its own, um, the sentence refers to a truth value, whereas when, when that sentence appears in a belief report, it refers to its own sense. Um, and so the sentence has a different extension each time. Again, I'm, I'm not going to explain Frege in any detail here, but he's just an example of somebody who held that there are cases of, actually quite common cases of sensitivity to sentential context. Uh, another thing to note about our about Russell's purported counterexample is that it does not, it doesn't involve equivocation, at least not technically speaking. Um, the meaning of the term con white remains the same throughout the argument. It is used with the same definition throughout the argument. It's the extension that changes. Um, now, in normal cases of context sensitivity, we can uh, remove the apparent counterexample to logical laws by insisting that the context has to remain the same. But this move just isn't available in cases where the context is a matter is like given by the sentence structure. Now we can of course just stipulate that logical laws only hold for those expressions whose extension does not vary across sentential context. Yeah, fair enough. But there's a sort of, I, I guess there's an, a, a concern about about this move, about this distinction between legitimate and illegitimate interpretations. How exactly do we distinguish between, on the one hand, the logical nihilist, and on the other, the anti-nihilist who draws a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate interpretations? I mean, there's a, there's a concern, I guess, that by insisting that certain interpretations are illegitimate, even when, even when we're dealing with predicates that are perfectly well-defined, aren't you in practice just accepting that there are no arguments that are valid in all circumstances? You know, like, that 
what's what's the distinction there between the nihilist and the anti-nihilist who makes that distinction so um anyway that's the debate about about that um okay another objection to logical nihilism uh, an objection just to logical nihilism in general rather than simply to russell's specific argument is that it is self undermining because any argument for logical nihilism must itself use logic in in giving any argument we must make an inference from a set of premises to the nihilist conclusion so if logical nihilism is true this undermines the force of any argument in favor of it uh, the logical nihilist must accept that the argument for nihilism is invalid but then if the argument's invalid well we can just reject it right so the point important point to remember here is that the logical nihilist only rejects the claim that there are logical laws where these are supposed to preserve truth in all circumstances even if there are no logical laws it may still be the case that particular instances of argument forms are acceptable so take the argument if the moon is made of cheese then it is edible the moon is made of cheese therefore it is edible we can all agree that the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion in this particular case and in other cases relevantly similar it's just that modus ponens is not logically valid the truth of the premises does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion for all possible interpretations of the non-logical expressions russell draws an analogy to dialetheism as we noted dialetheists accept that there are true contradictions and to deal with true contradictions requires a paraconsistent logic dialetheists will claim that disjunctive syllogism is not logically valid they have to claim this um, because if you accept disjunctive syllogism then that in conjunction with certain logical laws that nobody wants to give up um, uh, entails that anything can be derived from a contradiction so a contradiction will entail everything and there's the proof um, so giving up disjunctive syllogism seems like a fairly radical conclusion because disjunctive syllogism is an important argument form but dialetheists will accept that there are all kinds of circumstances where we can use disjunctive syllogism in particular there's no problem with using disjunctive syllogism in consistent situations if i know that you have gone to the shop either by walking or by taking your bike and i see your bike outside then i can legitimately infer that you have walked to the shop this is because true contradictions simply don't arise in this kind of context and the counter examples to disjunctive syllogism are generated by true contradictions um, graham priest probably the most prominent defender of dialetheism says that disjunctive syllogism is quasi valid where an inference is quasi valid just in case it preserves truth in consistent situations so the logical nihilist can make a similar claim although there are no inferences that are valid in all circumstances the circumstances where classical logical inferences fail to hold are all really weird um, they're, they're, they're highly technical, highly esoteric, and they're not relevant to the vast majority of what goes on in philosophy and science and other forms of inquiry and even everyday life. Um, in particular, the nihilist will hold that the argument for logical nihilism is just fine. The truth of its premises guarantees the truth of its conclusion, um, given the sort of argument it is. Uh, it's just that we could find some weird non-logical expressions, maybe involving self-reference or predicates sensitive to sentential context or whatever. Um, we could find these weird non-logical expressions, which, when substituted for the non-logical expressions in our argument, would result in true premises and a false conclusion. Um, perhaps the, ni the logical nihilist could try to develop a more general notion of quasi validity where an argument is quasi valid just in case it preserves truth in some class of normal situations or whatever um, but uh, certainly the the um, logical nihilism is not self undermining in any in, in, in any obvious way um, that, that the objection suggests um, all right well that's that's all uh, as I say this is not a view that has been developed in all that much detail um, but well hopefully that gave you something to think about there and uh, yeah, that's it. Goodbye.